Brad Richard McPherson, and I'm uh, very pleased to be on your show. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Brad Richard McPherson, and I'm uh, very pleased to be on your show. Uh, Devin Blaine was kind enough to um, introduce us and uh, arrange this, so I looked you up to see what you had been doing over your lifetime, and I got stuck in the 1970s when you're a Boy Scout camp. <laughs> so I don't think either one of us have really moved on from that point in our lives, although yours was the middle of 1970s and mine was in uh, uh, the early part of uh, 1950s as a Cub Scout. Wow. Thank you. Uh, that's that's a great piece of information. You know, uh, somebody asked me why I do Awakened Nation, and I said, you know, it goes back to those days in, in the 1970s when anything was possible, uh, In Search Of was on television. Eric Von Daniken uh, brought out the book Chariots of the Gods. You could talk about anything. And those stories of sitting around the campfire at scout camp, uh, I love those conversations. And it was about anything. So that's what today is uh, going to be about, my friend. And uh, I really welcome to the show. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate being on the show. And you and you talk about sitting around a campfire. Um, every year for uh, a lot of years, when I was stationed in the Navy in San Diego, every August, I would go with my dad, my brother, and my son, and we'd go up in the southern Nevada mountains for seven to ten days. Wow. And it's amazing when you just sit around and you don't have any television, you don't have any phone, you don't have any radio. It's amazing how you learn so much more about yourself and your family and talk about life. Yeah. So I understand that. Um, later on, as I've moved throughout life and in the position I'm in now, um, it's important for people to sit around and talk to each other. In my particular case, what I'm involved with the molten salt nuclear battery, shortly after I got involved, I realized that one of the things I had to do for them, uh, the two founders, was to make sure that they had time every quarter to go around and sit and talk to other PhDs uh, that taught uh, nuclear engineering or nuclear-related uh, courses at universities. So I put that into our overall plan. I don't care what they talk about. I don't think they should have an agenda. I just have learned over my 60 years in the nuclear business that it's good to let people sit around and talk. Yeah. You let them sit around and talk, they will ident They already know all the problems. And collectively, they know almost all the solutions. So just let them get together and talk. I agree. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're listening to Richard McPherson. Uh, I'm excited to have him on the show. I'm going to read your bio real quick, uh, Richard. I feel like I should be calling you Dr. Richard McPherson with the things you've done. Uh, but here it goes. Richard McPherson has been involved in nuclear energy since attending Admiral Rickover's famous nuclear power school in 1964. After his 20-year Navy career, Richard was asked, because of the Chernobyl accident, to be the United States representative to the International Atomic Energy Agency on a special six-nation group to study nuclear fuel cycle facilities, the environment, and public opinion. Today, his focus is on manufacturing consent and deploying the molten salt nuclear battery worldwide, thus fulfilling President Eisenhower's offer to provide American nuclear energy to the world for peace, prosperity, and security. So welcome to the show once again, Richard. Um, I want to kick things off with a question, and uh, this is probably one of my favorite questions. Back in the, the early days of this country, as we started to get a little more modernized and suburbia started to br uh, sprout up, families used to sit on the pr front porch during the summer, and they'd share stories and talk, and then they'd, you know, have dinner and share recipes together. And they, they were 
more communal, more communicative. But then air conditioning came into the household <laughs> and television, and we all went inside. And so I want to ask, how does technology change our lives and even our behavior, maybe? Ha, that is the question of the century. <laughs> I used to like you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, you know, I've been through this whole era from uh, the, my earliest recollection is six years old in 1950 mm -hmm. when my dad got stationed at China Lake Naval Ordnance Test Station in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And uh, we didn't have air conditioning. What we had was a swamp cooler. Oh, a swamp cooler is you just air that you run over water and it gets its natural eva evaporation effect. Mm hmm. So there's two major stages in my life that you just hit on that I talk about with people. One is uh, air conditioning. Uh, when did we move into a home that uh, was comfortable uh, all year round because we had heat and ventilation and air conditioning? Mm -hmm. The other one is we morphed from the, from the uh, into the digital world and that has been a long process to go from analog to digital. Mm -hmm. Part of that process, of course, has been uh, what you brought about earlier with the invention of the cell phone uh, by Marty Cooper in 1973 uh, when he was with uh, Motorola. But more recently, it's the, the computer by itself before we had cell phones we have today, and people started spending more and more time on the computer. Um, yeah. Google uh, came around, uh, the internet came around. Interestingly enough, in a job I went to in 1972 in the Navy, there was a, uh, in the cubicle that I had, there was a, a teletype machine, it had a cover on it, and it sat there, and after a few months, I decided to pull out the book and see what it was. Well, it turned out it was one of the test units for what became the internet. You're kidding. Wow. No. So I'm reading through this book and it had a, it had a thing that says WW and that stood for worldwide. Right. And you could ask a question. So I thought, well, here's this ID number on this thing. I'm gonna ask a question, it was late in the day. So it had a big box of yellow paper underneath it that fed up through it. So I wrote out very precisely, as it said in the instruction manual, how to rate, ask a question. So I did. So I sent the question out there, nothing happened. So I go home, come back in the next morning, and the canvas cover that's covering this machine is bulging. <laughs> I pull it off and all this paper fell out. Wow. I had answers from all over the place. That was my introduction to the internet, 1972. Wow. So I have been using, I used it both in the Navy until I retired in 1983. And then I picked it up uh, right after that. I had my first IBM PCXT in the late 1970s, early late 1970s when it first came out. So I've been using it ever since. So the internet caused people to isolate themselves from their family and friends and neighbors. Right. Um, Bill Gates took advantage of that uh, trend. Back in the 1990s, he hired a, a young a teenager, a young t a girl and a young boy and set them up in their house just so they could communicate. And they were hired to do it. Their families were paid. And uh, as they communicated, Microsoft picked off everything that they were communicating about and the way they were communicating about things. So Microsoft learned a lot of that from those two kids that they hired back in the 90s. Wow. Today, we now have the iPhone, the cell phone that's now turned into what was a computer. And I use it for most everything. And so now that's even isolated people more. Yes, it has. With them. 
So whenever they want to talk to somebody or find out something, they've got it on their phone. So we've gone through this 50-year period of morphing from analog to digital where people more and more are isolating themselves because of technology, and that's not healthy. I agree. And I want to get into this a little bit. You know, it, this is kind of ironic. We started my very first season, my very first episode with was with Nigel Wall. He's from England, uh, and he was a nuclear engineer. And here we are full circle, and we're going to be talking about this device that you really is revolutionizing the nuclear power industry. And uh, I just want everybody to know, we're going to talk about this a little bit. I grew up near Three Mile Island. And um, for any of you know that, that was one of the almost nuclear disasters here in the U.S. Um, But I want to talk about this thing. It's called a molten salt nuclear battery. And uh, tell me about this like I'm six years old, because you are clearly the smartest guy in the room here today. But I want to know how this revolutionizes everything. And I saw some of your stats on this, and we'll talk a little bit about this. This is about power output. You said 10 megawatt output uh, as a quarter acre facility that houses uh, your molten battery is 92% capacity factor uh, efficiency, whereas a wind farm is at 30% capacity. Uh, That requires 2,700 acres. A solar farm is 25% of the capacity factor, and that requires 500 acres, whereas the, your molten uh, salt nuclear battery can be in a 30 by 30 foot building. This is fascinating when it comes to energy output. Uh, let's dig into this. Well, let's take what you just got done saying about the, very, about the amount of land area that's required. What we're talking about is energy. What you're talking about is really energy density. Mm -hmm. So when you take a look at uh, wind and solar, they uh, are have very low energy density, whereas nuclear has the most nuclear density. I mean, energy density. I would say uh, efficiency. Is that is that a uh, a good word? Efficiency is the efficiency of the use of the fuel or in this case, the wind okay. or the solar. Got it. Sorry uh, to interrupt. The density is how much is available. Okay. Uh, so in a, in a, in a very small amount of uranium, it's, it's the same as lots of railroad cars or coal or oil, lots of millions of cubic feet of natural gas or lots of hours of wind energy or solar energy in that. Um, the, the, the molten salt nuclear battery is only available to us because of a guy by the name of Dr. Paul Murata. And Paul went, it was interesting. Paul went to work in naval reactors as a designer in 1983, the same year that I retired. So over now working in design for naval reactors is the most unique job in the whole wide world when it comes to nuclear, because since 1946, naval reactors has had this facility in upstate New York near Saratoga. And they have all the information uh, about nuclear, everything. So the people who work there are really spoiled uh, because they get everything. So Paul worked there for years. And while he was there, he realized that our military bases were not protected. Our submarines were, our aircraft carriers were, our other surface craft uh, that used nuclear power plants were, but our military bases weren't. So over the years, it was always in the back of his mind. So around 2015, he decided to start thinking about what could be done to protect our military bases. And doodling on a Yet Pat a yellow paper, he came up with the idea of the molten salt nuclear battery. He calls it a battery because it's simply replaced every 10 years. That's the current design. So after 10 years, it's used, the fuel is used up enough where you shut it down, you install another one, take the other one back to a facility and recycle it. So 
I was introduced to him in early 2018 by uh, Dr. Richard Christensen from the University of Idaho. And Paul starts talking and he said, I call it a battery, but it has no pumps and no valves. Well, I was hooked because being an operator and maintainer of nuclear power plants over um, a third of my lifetime, there's a couple of things that I that I do not like. I do not like pumps and valves. And number three is I don't like the operators. In that order, they're a problem child. <laughs> so I was just told that here is a reactor that has no pumps and no valves. So what's going through my mind is, what I've just heard is, this is what the world has always needed. We have a power source now that there is no excuse anywhere in the world for people to go hungry or for people not to have clean water to drink because we can now add power. We have an energy source for agriculture. We have an energy source for desalinization of water or cleaning up contaminated water. Mm -hmm. So there's no excuse. So in wow. addition to being hooked on that, um, I became very involved to the point that I'm now the CEO of Idaho Energy Inc. My responsibility is getting them manufactured, tested, and deployed. And fortunately, right here in Idaho, we have a company called Premier Technology uh, in, in Blackfoot, Idaho. And I knew the owners. And I knew that he was a qualified, uh, uh, had a qualified nuclear quality assurance program. So his name is Doug Sayre. So I got him and Paul Murata together in the summer of 2019. And I suggested that they sign an NDA. The next day, I suggested they sign um, an MOU to work together. And in June of 2020, uh, they became the qualified vendor to manufacture the molten salt nuclear battery. Nice. It's simplicity in design. It um, has no pumps. And it doesn't have any pumps because it's natural circulation. Where right. Paul got the idea from was a molten salt nuclear reactor experiments in the 1960s except he and then applied modern materials and high-speed computing to look at them and see what could be done to make them uh, far less complicated and hopefully wind up with a autonomous reactor. And that's what he's done. I find this fascinating because, you know, I, I, I don't know that much about nuclear power, but I can tell you, Ladies and gentlemen, you know, a nuclear power plant, a traditional one, needs those big steam towers uh, outside of them. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, where, where the heat generated from the nuclear reactor is uh, heating up the water to generate turbines. Is that correct? Yeah, we have, we have uh, our commercial fleet in the United States is what are commonly called light water reactors. There's two types. Mm -hmm. There's a pressurized water reactor and there's a boiling water reactor. There's 93 left in the United States. Uh, about two thirds of them are pressurized water reactor. About one third of them are boiling water reactors. And what they, they require is they require a large water conditioning system to supply water to both the reactor and the steam plant. And the steam plant, when it goes through the turbine, uh, the steam goes through the turbine, it goes into a condenser, and those condensers need to be cooled. And that's what you see with those big towers that are on site. Right. Mm -hmm. That's circulating water that's going through the condensers and condensing the steam. And then the steam goes back to the steam generator where it becomes steam again and goes back through the turbine. Um, so in addition to the con water conditioning system on one side of the plant, on the other side of the plant, you have two different main systems on a light water plant that you have to have. One of them is to handle the radioactive water. The other one is to handle the partially spent nuclear fuel, which some people call waste, which is misnomer because it's an asset. It just needs to be recycled. Right. Wow. Molten salt nuclear battery doesn't need water. And the molten salt nuclear battery will not be refueled in place like light water reactors are. It will be sent back to a facility yet to be designed, but the processes in the facility are being designed right now, where we will separate the uranium and the salt 
and that salt will be cleaned and reused almost 100%. And we're being conservative on the uranium side, where uh, at least 90% of the uranium will be recycled and used in a future molten salt nuclear battery, just like the salt. But there will be some actinides left, a small amount of actinides. Um, and that's what people worry about. Well, there's no reason to worry about them. We've been handling them since the Manhattan Project. We know how to store them. And also, as technology is advancing, more and more uses are being found for those actinides. So they will become a, a long-term asset. The number one fear that most people have of nuclear power is if there's a meltdown. Chernobyl is a very prime example. Um, and after what you just explained, this is why uh, power plants, nuclear power plants have to be built usually along a river or on a river, uh, such as Three Mile Island. Um, the big fear is a nuclear meltdown. And you, and it, tell me I'm wrong or right, but it sounds like the this battery, this molten salt battery is much safer uh, on many, many levels. It is. Uh, the simply put, um, if we poke a hole in the molten salt nuclear battery and some of the molten salt drains out with a fuel, it will automatically shut down and start cooling and it will freeze. In other words, the molten salt will uh, solidify and it stops the uh, heat from being built up from fissioning. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways that we are guarding against that ever happening. But take a, take a, a case like Chernobyl. Chernobyl was the operating procedures in Chernobyl. By the way, the reason that I was asked to go to the International Atomic Energy Agency and the reason the Six Nation Group was founded was because in 1987, the Soviets went to Hans Blix, who was the director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and said, our people don't trust us, we need help. He was smart enough to call uh, the Secretary of Energy at the time, Admiral James D. Watkins, and he said, here's the conversation I just had, and what do you think? Well, together what they did was they formed a special six-nation group to study nuclear fuel cycle facilities, the environment, and public opinion for four years, which you mentioned before. Uh -huh. It was the United States, Canada, Switzerland, which was really Germany, I never did understand that, Spain, and the Soviet Union. And I was living in Hong Kong at the time when I got a call from our State Department and ask me, if we ask you, would you represent the United States at the International Atomic Energy Agency? I looked at the phone and I said, who is this really? <laughs> <laughs> I have a particular set of skills, right? <laughs> I know. So make a long story short, I took the gig and, and I did that. So I'm the only American that's ever had the opportunity, actually luxury, of being able to take four years out of their life and study nuclear fuel cycle facilities worldwide the opinion and uh, and uh, the environment. So I'm a most unique person uh, to be talking, not just to you, but to be talking about the value to this country and the world of uh, commercial nuclear power. Thank you for your service. I mean, honestly, you know, sometimes the world, uh, at least I see it lately, they're starting to do things on their own and excluding the United States. So um, you being involved, I think, is uh, phenomenal. And it's uh, probably a tip to, uh, of the hat to your abilities, uh, I would have to say. Well, it's nothing It's nothing I planned. The only thing I ever planned was to avoid the draft, join the Navy, went submarines, nuclear power. It now, just you, all happened. When we were in the green room, you were joking around. You said uh, you, you can fly a plane and uh, drive a submarine and something else, but your wife teased you. How many vehicles can you, you, you fly, drive, or whatever? Uh, my father was a naval aviator from 1942 to 1966, and when I was 13 years old, started teaching me how to fly. Mm -hmm. So I've been flying since 1957. Wow. Um, I, I qualified to drive submarines, uh, surface ships. I've been a sailor all my life. I used to have a 63-foot stasial schooner. I chartered out of Hawaii. Um, I, uh, but... And I operate nuclear power plants, and I've operated every other kind of nuclear plant there is. But you here are. is here's our here's on our here's on our receiver for the for the TV, and it says one two zero zero flashing. And my wife tells everybody, I got this nuclear engineer. He can't even 
he can't even make it quit flashing 1200. That's all she's got on me. That's all you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> It's all she's got. Everything else I take care of. Um, right. You sound like the most interesting man in the world, I swear. Um, now, I, I want to talk about this uh, because I'm envisioning, you know, I, I've done a little research for my first book, Liquid Leadership, which was really about how a new generation uh, and technology was really changing how we behave, how we do things, how we work, how we pay, and how we play. And so... Uh, I can envision this molten uh, salt battery being used uh, for, you know, like individual blocks uh, in a city. Am I correct? Are, are powering, you know, an entire farm, things like this. Um, talk about that. I want to I want to hear this vision because this is uh, this is a game changer, really. So a friend of mine who's a retired Navy captain on submarines about two years ago, uh, called me up and, and, and he had found out what I was doing. And I won't use these exact words, but I'll use it close. He said, Mac, do you know what you're doing? I said, well, no, not really. <laughs> he said, do you know that when the industry, meaning the nuclear industry, finds out about this, they're going to defecate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, yes. So I'm a student of history. Been a student of history since 19... 57. Mm -hmm. When I asked my dad where do you get gas for your airplane when his when he was stationed at Barbers Point Naval Air uh, Station. I didn't realize that until a decade later when I'd already gone through nuclear power school and I was I'd just gotten qualified as a lower level engine room watch on my first nuclear powered submarine. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about my life up until that date and it suddenly dawned on me. I had become a student of energy when we were when I was living with my dad back in Hawaii in 1957, mm -hmm. here I am today. I'm still a student of energy. Um, being selected for the to represent the U.S. at the International Atomic Energy Agency caused me to request access to information so that it would fill in all the blanks for me, because from my standpoint, I'm going over to represent the United States with the smartest people in the world. And I didn't want to embarrass myself, much less the United States. Right. So I've had quite an education. So when you talk about leadership, it's interesting because leadership really hasn't changed. It's about a human interaction with another human. That's all it is. Right. You know, depending on our upbringing and our age, and that's what mostly affects it, uh, depends on where our mind is, and what our mindset is. Uh, people get frustrated with the kids today. Doesn't do any good. People got frustrated with me. Didn't <laughs> do them any good. Right. Right. It's just changing. People have changed. Now, some of it has come about naturally. And some of that has come around forced, intended to force a change in the education and upbringing of children. That's not good. Yeah. And so one of the things that I have always been involved in is education. Um, education from the time I was very young in the Navy, educating others. Uh, I've started educating civilians in various things. Um, and I still do that. And that's part of our overall plan is that we have, de we have developed a training program um, that uh, takes into account um, everything about science and math and technology with an emphasis on energy and especially nuclear power. Because if you want to look at what the answer is to the majority of the world's problems today, it's, it's nuclear power. Uh -huh. And the real question is, how, can, how fast can we shift to nuclear power so that we, have, we start saving, not getting rid of, but start saving coal, oil, and natural gas. They're far too uh, valuable as, as finite resources in the Earth's crust to burn them as we do. Yeah. Same way with uranium. That's why there is one of, one of the uranium fuels that people are talking about is triso fuel. It's a waste of, it's squandering our natural resources to use triso fuel because it's it's truly a waste. It's one-time use, and then we've got to figure out a way to dispose yeah. of it. 
I've often wondered, you know, because I grew up during the era of the, the you know, the 70s muscle cars and, uh, you know, the getting more efficient. And then all of a sudden, you know, my dad had a, a 1951 Studebaker when I was a teenager in the 70s, you know, I love that car. But it seemed like uh, I just sat there and thought to myself, why can't they recycle the exhaust from these things and use it for something else? Or, and here's another thing, um, why aren't more cars hybrids? Why aren't more cars, you know, balancing between the two worlds until we get this electrical grid up uh, that can support uh, e-vehicles? And um, so there's a part of me that, you know, I look at the science and I go, man, we're making headway, but there's always that one or two parts that are missing from the fuel efficiency, from the exhaust, from the, you know, the byproduct is sometimes worse than what we're getting uh, in the, in the efficiency of, uh, of the motor, uh, so to speak. And uh, yeah. Could you comment on that a little bit? Sure. I'm really an engine guy was an engine yeah. guy growing up as a teenager. Um, and um, so let's talk about the muscle cars and let's talk about drag racing and let's talk about formula one and let's talk about NASCAR. Uh, those engines, let's start with NASCAR. Those engines are basically stock engines, except they're stock engines that are very well tuned. Um, they've had, uh, they make sure that the valve seats are ground in uh, so that the valve seats uh, seat very well. Uh, they have really good, uh, they make sure that they've got good uh, matched piston rings on them, et cetera. So, those are very efficient engines. And we should be building more of the, those efficient engines instead of less. Right. We don't, and we don't because of a number of things. And let's start with the uh, EPA, US EPA, California Air Resources Board, and also my time when I was at the International Atomic Energy Agency. In 1989, we have a we have a briefing book that comes around every day at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And I noticed that the United Nations headquarters in, in New York was talking about the environment. Well, one of the things that I already learned at the International Atomic Energy Agency was since 1954, which at that time was from 25 years, they had been testing everything that was combustible every fuel possible that was combustible. Right. And they had tons of data on the environment. So I went to Hans Blix, the director general, and I suggested to him that the source of information that they needed at the United Nations was already available at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Why not send it to him? So he did. Then I saw what happened with the US EPA and California Resources Board and also the United Nations. What we hear from the United Nations today is the international climate change people right. and their meetings. Um, there was a, uh, the California Resources Board uh, that sort of took the lead in both helping and hindering progress in California was the South Coast Air Quality Basin in Los Angeles, California, and specifically headed up by a fellow by the name of Dr. Alan Lloyd. So they took that information that the United Nations had and they started changing, they started re-examining at taxpayers' expense and changing that environmental data to fit their needs. Yeah. Same thing happened with the EPA. So what we wound up with, since California is the largest seller of engines, vehicles in the country, California always leads the way and forces the rest of the country to go that way. Right. So California started imposing these artificial standards on emissions from vehicles. They did one good thing along the way. And it wasn't just the California Resources Board. This was already underway by engine manufacturers, uh, oil companies, and et cetera. And that is they got the lead out of gasoline, tetraethyl lead. Right. So... Getting the lead out of gasoline required that you make some material changes in engines, which they did. But that wasn't good enough. 
CARB is California Resources Board has continued on to make more and more stricter emission limits. And they only look at a few of the emissions. And what happened was by in 19, by 20, 2003, they had a set of emissions for diesel engines that you couldn't sell a diesel engine in the state of California anymore. So Cummings Diesels suddenly comes out with an engine that meets the specifications. At the time, I still knew people in research and development in Cummings, so I called them up, got these two guys on the phone, and I said, what's the fuel penalty? Dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> So they admitted it was maybe three to 5%. Well, it's more. You see, CARB doesn't care about that. California Resources Board doesn't care about that. They only care about what they call criteria pollutants. So suddenly Cummings knows that if it's gonna compete in California, it has to meet those standards. Right. So they're willing to push more diesel fuel through an engine and waste it. In other words, less efficiency in order to control an engine on emission standards. And that's what the trend has been, and that's what the entire nation has done. We now control our engines for diesels and gasoline on emissions. We don't control them on efficiency. So we use a lot more fuel. And along the way, two other things got interjected here that are not needed. One of them is ethanol, and the other one is biodiesel. With ethanol and biodiesel, we started growing a bunch of extra corn, and it took corn off the market that was meant for people to eat. Right. So we've had an adverse effect on the price of corn worldwide because we're making it into a fuel, a very costly fuel that we shouldn't have to be paying for. Yeah. Um, you talked about hybrids. I've been a fan of hybrids forever, but for limited uses. Mm -hmm. When you do all the start and stop driving in cities, such as um, buses, such as commuters, uh, et cetera, cabs. Though, that's an ideal situation for hybrids because the majority of your fuel is used when you go from a standing start to moving. So design a hybrid, and some are, so that when you are stopped, the battery gets you moving and then the in engine takes over. All right. So I support hybrids for those uses, but not for a whole bunch of other uses. And I totally do not support electric vehicles at all. It's interesting that you talk about this because back in the early 80s uh, or the late 80s or early 90s, I did a lot of industrial um, corporate meetings. And one of the top money makers for me was I worked at the studio that did a lot of the car manufacturing um, shows every year. And this was big money, and they rolled out all their new vehicles for the following year. So I worked with Ford, Lincoln Mercury, uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, all the top brands. And I noticed this. This was interesting. The United States government had mandated that by, let's say, the year 2000, 3% of all auto manufacturers had to be creating uh, e-vehicles of some sort. And I noticed we were getting a hold of the designs you know, 20 years before this was supposed to happen. And I'm looking at these things and Richard, it was as if they were intentionally designing something to fail. And I just found this fascinating because every year we'd get another, you know, roll out of these photos of these designer cars, these experiments and these things they were just playing around with. And then here's the game changer, Japan at one of the big auto shows, uh, I forget the year that was, they rolled out the first hybrid. And this thing got 78 miles to the gallon <laughs> and wowed the audience. And that's when American manufacturers decided, oh, maybe we should take this seriously. You know, they weren't doing that beforehand. And uh, I'm like you, I, I, I'm really on the fence with the e-vehicles. I love driving them. They're fun and everything. And that was, you know, original cars were electric. Um, but we're living in a in a world where I'll give you case in point. I went to Alaska with my father, and the number one thing I noticed is there were very few brand new cars. That was number one. <laughs> number two, they were all big, rugged SUV, what they label SUVs, but 
basically vehicles that can get through the snow. And when you live in Alaska, you have to plug your engine in so the engine block doesn't freeze and crack. And you could just see that the, this was fuel efficiency, uh, you know, you know the, the, the height of American, you know, creativity here. You could see everything from a Jimmy to, you know, a big pickup truck. Um, but I also know this for a fact, and maybe we can talk about this. They keep pushing these e-vehicles, and it, it's as if all of a sudden, hey, nothing else matters, just e-vehicles. And quite frankly, e-vehicles can't survive in places like Alaska. Uh, they haven't proven themselves yet to be rugged vehicles that don't, you know, die when it hits twenty below. Well, I want to I want to go back and talk about your experience uh, with the shows and hybrids, and uh, I'll go I'll talk about electric vehicles in Alaska in a moment. Sure. <clears throat> and I want to talk about the hybrid from Japan, but I want to go to two thousand and three. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Mercedes Benz on the engine side, it had been a client of mine for a while. And what a lot of people don't know is that Mercedes-Benz has two offices uh, for environmental purposes only in the United States. Hmm. One of them is in Ar- Ann Arbor, Michigan. The other one is in Long Beach, California. And the one in Long Beach, California is the one that does the testing. So they get to, and the, the president for many, many years, 20 years, was a guy by the name of Bert Hebrick. He and I got to know each other really, really well. And we got along because he understood engines and I understood engines. So there was a close bond there like nobody else I've had in the, in the, uh, in the motor industry. So he calls me up one day. He says, we're having our new hydrogen uh, car brought over from Germany, and I'd like you to come up and look at it. I'd love to. So I went up there. It's a good looking car. It's a hydrogen fueled engine. It has a tank in the back to fill it with hydrogen. So as I got to looking at it, I realized that it had mechanical joints in the fuel line that went from the tank to the engine. Hmm. And I said, there's four young, fairly young uh, German engineers with it. <clears throat> and I said, you can't have any mechanical joints. Well, that started a bunch of talk in German. You're right. <laughs> what is he talking about? This man from <laughs> America. A, yeah. Make a long story short, I they basically started disassembling the car, and I showed him the problems that they would have over the lifetime of the car, with the car uh, accumulating <laughs> hydrogen and blowing up. So wow. I, they wound up with one. I said, you get to have one mechanical joint. One, me- one mechanical uh, connector, and that's directly into the engine itself, because the engine is ve- the engine compartment is ventilated by the fan, so you're not going to have a hydrogen buildup. So, make a long story short, I've not seen it, but they went back to the factory, and they figured out how to make a hydrogen fuel tank with one piece of tubing that goes up to the engine and only one mechanical joint right there in the engine compartment. Wow. Now, why do I know that? I know that from submarines. Hmm. We deal with hydrogen on submarines for a different reason. And we don't want hydrogen to cause an explosion. If you want to fast forward to 2011, you can see what happens when you have a buildup in hydrogen when Fukushima Daiichi and the tsunami that hit it, those four plants there, yeah. That explosion on Saturday morning that everybody saw in the news, that was a hydrogen explosion. Huh. Hydrogen and accumulated in the top of uh, unit number one there. <clears throat> and I I was already, I already, the Japanese had already given me access to a camera overlooking the whole scene uh, because I got a call three hours after the tsunami hit from the head nuclear safety guy in Japan asking me my thoughts. So I gave him my thoughts, and he gave me access to a camera through the computer. And when I saw that first explosion, I thought, it's not what we call a a, a steam zerk reaction. It's it's something else, but it was confusing. Why it was confusing was because I knew that General Electric had issued right after those reactors were built, 
for all of those boiling water reactors, they had issued a change to the uh, top of the containment whereby they would automatically uh, or manually vent hydrogen in the event of a problem, such hmm. as Three Mile Island. But the Japanese never made that change. So uh -huh. hydrogen accumulated up there, and at some point in time, there was a spark from something and ignited it, and that's the explosion I saw. Wow. So um, the other thing that you brought up was the motor show and hybrid in Japan. Uh, back, in, uh, back in 1985 and 1986, I spent a lot of time in Japan with a guy by the name of Soji Teramuro. And he did it because I'm an energy guy. Right. And I spent time with uh, uh, mostly Toyota. But all the major engine companies over there were his clients. And uh, one of the things that they were already building over there very successfully and uh, were operating very well was hybrid vehicles. So I got to see them up close and personal and get, and get talked through the design and development of them and uses of them. So I already knew that they would be a good deal. And so that convinced me. So I'm glad you got to see that. You talk about Alaska. Alaska does get pretty cold. Gets to be yeah. minus 50, minus 60 degrees. They actually have a program because of the federal government where they're putting electro vehicle, electric vehicles and chargers in Alaska. Hmm. Um, I think it's a total waste of money. I of taxpayers' money. And I think it's a total um, imposition on the people of Alaska to have to put up with them. Yeah, uh, There are certain people in Alaska, like anywhere else, that like them because they think that it's they're green and they're good and all this and that, all of which is not true. Right. Um, but um, Alaska is not the place uh, or any place where you have a lot of rain or precipitation yeah. is no place to have an electric vehicle. Uh, there is numerous reports of electric vehicles uh, catching fire and exploding that have been exposed to precipitation, the batteries. Yeah, yeah. You can go to the uh, you can go to a number of sites and find it. So yeah. I'm I'm with you on that. Uh, I am, however, uh, big on hydrogen vehicles. I think we will see a shift from electric to hydrogen. Uh, we know how to manage it. We know how to get it into a car. And and it, and they will be efficient, and we won't have the fuel cells that people are talking about today. Because good designers, one of which I know, with the General Motors, have already designed new um, gasoline engines and new diesel engines to run on hydrogen. So we will see that is going to be a large growth industry um, over the next few decades, and therein lies an opportunity for the molten salt yeah. nuclear battery. Because they're going to they're going to choose from one of two technologies to manufacture hydrogen. The technology that will be chosen will be uh, producing hydrogen by electrolysis. And either one of the technologies, you need a you need a very good power source that doesn't use fossil fuels, and the best power source is going to be uh, the molten salt nuclear battery. I like this. I like this a lot. Can you explain to me? You you said you're not a big fan of the electric cars and e-vehicles but can you explain why because i i have my reasons but i want to hear yours well it, it's quite a number of reasons actually it starts with the materials that you make the batteries out of again we've told, we're talking about finite materials in in the earth and so it uses a lot of finite materials in the earth and electric vehicles in the united states and most other countries i think um, are all um, only possible because uh, tax politicians take taxpayers' funds and give it to electric vehicle manufacturers to offset the true cost of the electric vehicles. That's number one. That's two, that's two things. Right. One is the use of uh, finite resources in, this, in the earth. And number two is taking taxpayers' money away and financing them. The electric, uh, the original uh, GM Volt, Volt, GM Volt, was it GM Volt? Yes. yes. The original GM Volt had to sell them, GM got an average of $122,000 in taxpayers' money. 
Uh, the third reason is because of, we have no way of recycling the batteries. Yeah. There is no economic way of recycling the batteries. And um, if we can't recycle something and reuse it, I don't think we ought to be building it. I agree. I agree. You know, my, my problem is, you know, it takes cobalt and lithium and these mines over in Africa, you see them and other places um, they use slave labor uh, basically to to dig these things up children are being used and it's all this mad rush to to push uh, for uh, green energy you know and so I'm a big fan of uh, free markets and capitalism and uh, how yes yeah, some markets need a push some business sectors need a little push look at the internet uh, if the Clinton administration hadn't, you know, pushed with the Federal Reserve to get some money out there for VCs and everybody to take these dot com companies public. Who knows where the internet would be today? It would have trickled into our lives quite slowly. Um, but here's something right now. I see it. They're pushing and pushing and pushing. And our grid, our electrical grid, it isn't even a tenth of where it needs to be if they want everybody to drive an electric car. And it seems like they don't want anybody to have a, ch a choice in the matter. And that I have a problem with. Um, and this is why I'm a fan of the hybrid. It's it's right in between the two worlds. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a very weird time we live in, Richard. You were, you were touching on a little bit about the EPA when they get involved in things. And sometimes, you know, you, you have California dictating terms and all of a sudden, here we are with a solution that's not only more expensive, uh, it, it's costing, the taxpayers paid for it, but don't get any of the relief from it. Um, and one of my biggest things that drives me nuts is they're always comparing you know, pollution output in China and India. And then third on that list is the United States. And we're not even close to China and India's you know, dirt in the air, let's put it that way. And Europe is never on that list because they treat Europe as individual countries. So Germany is way down at the bottom, whereas the United States is number three. When we're the most, I think we are one of the most conscientious countries when it comes to emissions and polluting the air and things like this, we actually shouldn't, I don't believe we should be on that list. Well, um, are you in the Los Angeles area? I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. Ah, one of my favorite cities in the world. <laughs> Mine too. So in 1957, the first environmental rules were put into place in the city of Los Angeles. And it was logical that they would put them in place. Yeah. Because by 1957, the Los Angeles basin was full of smog. And it was full of smog from vehicles. And that's what led to the removal of tetraethyl lead from gasoline. And it led to several other good things. We still haven't escaped all the pollution, but the United States has been the leader all along the way. There is no other country in the world that has led us in cleaning up the air. Now we're the number one country that is penalized yep. because all these people hold these meetings and they want the United States to pay for the rest of them. Yeah. Not the least of which is China. And, and China is a communist-run country. Mm -hmm. um, it's the most polluting country. Mm -hmm. They What they say in these meetings versus what they do is two completely different things. Yeah. And Americans suffer. And right now we're paying way too much for energy. We shouldn't be. Uh, and part of that is because of the environmental rules. Yeah. Another part of that is to be able to even build something new, like a new refinery or a new steel mill or a new uh, hotel or large business anywhere. Right. We've got something called the, the 1969 National Environmental Policy Act. And that's killing America, it's killing off yeah, America. I remember when, uh, you know, it, it seems like technologies that come along that could uh, revolutionize everything but destroy the existing you know system that's in place always seem to get pushed away bought out disappear things like that bloom 
Bloom Energy is one of the things I was watching for a while. I even included it in my my first book. I thought that was brilliant work. But it seems like the, uh, you know, we have nothing more than industrial complexes in the United States of America. It isn't just military military industrial complex. There's a healthcare industrial complex. There's a you know there's a complex everywhere, and it seems like we're now developing an energy industrialized complex as well. Well, we've had it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but for a long time, let's go back to the development of it. Um, and let's just stick with going from uh, wood to coal to oil and natural gas. Um, we got our biggest boost in oil in World War II. I mm -hmm. mean, excuse me, World War I. Because we taught a lot of young Americans to fly airplanes, drive ships, and drive vehicles. Mm -hmm. So the oil companies responded by providing the fuels that we needed. Right. Another big jump came in World War II, where we taught many more millions to drive airplanes, vehicles of all kinds, ships, submarines, etc. So the, the United States led the way with technology, and even before World War I was sharing that technology with the Middle East. Um, Middle East oil had been found in various countries. The UK started buying rights over there. France started buying rights over there. The United States started buying rights over there. Yeah. But the technology to drill and to pump that oil and to refine it almost all came out of the United States. Mm. The United States has been the leader all along. Yeah. And yet today we're accepting being penalized for being a leader in all of these industrial areas that have yeah. to do with energy. Now, nuclear is easy. Uh, it was after uh, President Eisenhower's speech that caused the Soviets to go in and start pulling out the stops to stop commercial nuclear power from developing. Mm -hmm. Because they did not, they, they are very, very aware of what we did to gear up and go win World War I for other people. Right. Win World War II for other people. And they could not allow us to have commercial nuclear power and especially share it. And by that time, China was involved. Right. So the state that we have today is, yes, we have a huge energy complex. But what we don't have is a cogent and viable energy policy. And that sits with only one group of people in the world, and that's members of Congress. And they have conflicting interests because, yeah. of, what they, because of what they as individuals um, are led to believe or led to do by virtue of who provides them with money to get elected or reelected. Ain't that the truth? You know, uh, I used to have a blog, and I wrote a little bit about this. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, a group of very large companies were starting to realize they uh, they were being focused on for polluting our waterways and you know dumping chemicals, things like this. So they got together, and this is like Coca-Cola, DuPont, a, a list of other companies, and they hired a PR firm to come up with this campaign to shift the focus on them to us you know people and they came up with uh you remember that commercial where the native american is standing on the end uh side of the road and someone dumps garbage out and they they came up with the term litter bug and they shifted everything about pollution environment green whatever onto the people instead of the corporations that are dumping in our waterways um taking byproducts and pumping them into the air and different things like this. And this is what you see now. I, I feel like doing a TED talk about this. Um, corporations are missing the from the narrative. You know, the corporations that pollute. I'm not saying everybody does, but these companies that have avoided focus because the narrative all over the world is, you know, human beings are the, the carbon problem on planet Earth, and we're going to get fined for being carbon life forms. Um, you know, companies are getting carbon credits. We get a $10 fine. <laughs> so, I mean, um, to me, 
this is fuzzy logic that they're using <laughs> to try That's and, a good and term. well, That's push that. I don't, I don't, how do I pollute the environment? I mean, what's the worst I do? I drive a car, you know, that, that suddenly is an evil thing to drive a car. Um, and, uh, I try to recycle all my, my, uh, you know, stuff, but you know, I used to live on Staten Island. I remember one night, one o'clock in the morning on a, I guess it was a Tuesday night or whatever. Um, we had separated all our cans of bottles and we shoved them in a garbage can. And for some reason I hopped in the car and I was about to drive down the hill and the garbage collector came, grabbed all the recyclables and the, the direction I was driving in was towards a dump. Well, they took all the recyclables, recyclables and put it in the exact same dump that everything else goes to. And that's when I realized, you know, this whole recycling thing, if you get fined, yeah, they, they created it so they could find things. But if we were truly recycling, everybody, everything would be recycled in, in America. And it's not. And so the, this is the biggest scam uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because <laughs> you're getting me on my soapbox, Richard. <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm totally with you. Mm -hmm. um, we went through this period, we're still going through it, of forcing recycling on us, but we're not doing the recycling that we should be doing. Right. Let me give you the single biggest example that bothers me. I have been going to Japan for a lot of years, at, at, primarily at their request. Um, I think I saw this in the early 1990s, I think. And I don't remember the name of the company anymore. But Japan is a very is an island. They don't have a lot of extra room, right, for either agriculture or municipal waste, etc. So they have addressed those problems, uh, especially with municipal waste. So a company in Japan came up with a, a, a design of a system that would take plastics run them through this machine and get oil out of the other end. So I should have done something with it, but I didn't. But then I noticed that somebody in the United States did pick it up and start moving with it. So I thought, well, this is great. We're going to see these in every state. <laughs> because one thing we've got is a lot of plastic. Yeah. So I thought we would see them in every single state, and I'm wrong. And I don't know why, and I just haven't had the time to go back and find out why. But all of this plastic that we're putting in the landfills um, should be going into one of these machines and getting useful oil out the other end. Yeah. What it can be used for, I don't know, because I, I might have a sheet somewhere about what, the, what it was, but I really don't. But just by virtue of the fact that Japan went to it, it was available. An American brought it over here. I'm pretty sure it's an American. Uh, we should be seeing that. We should be seeing those everywhere. We shouldn't be putting plastics in landfill. It's I just agree. like we shouldn't be mixing uh, steel with aluminum and glass in landfills. Yeah, I agree with All that. All recyclable. Uh, I agree with that a one hundred percent because. I literally remember this as a teenager. We're living in my my hometown of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and we had a, a drugstore across the street that was also a convenience store. And my dad and I, we saw this truck pull up and pull out the very first plastic liters of Coca-Cola and other sodas, and we were just laughing. Why would anybody put soda in a plastic jar? You know, it's like we we couldn't wrap our head around it, and we went from everything being in glass to suddenly everything's plastic and plastic comes from the oil industry. Uh, and so now everything seems to be plastic. And I agree with you. What are we doing with our recyclable materials? They're dumping them in landfills. And I think it's the biggest political con job we we've had thrust on us in this country that I've, I've ever seen because I'm constantly questioning uh, this narrative of the green movement. Why is it failing? Why is nobody interested in it? Why are politicians pushing now for this or that? And so I don't have the mechanism in my head yet, but I can definitely tell you it probably has to do with money. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's 100% economics. 
Yeah. Uh, it's, it's cheaper to the machines that they make, they use to make those plastic containers. Uh, they can crank them out so much more cheaply than they can glass. Or in the case of, we still get milk in, we get, still get milk, milk in glass bottles or with it in, in this uh, particular uh, fa- uh, paper that's wax coated. Right. But everything else is in plastic now. There are researchers that will tell you, now not many because they get hammered by big big corporations, they will tell you that these plastics give off gases that are harmful to us and, and cause cancer. Yeah. So um, I still use a plastic glass. I shouldn't be, and I know better. Right. But I still do because I don't drop it and break it as often. <laughs> I have broken more glasses in the, over this summer than I, I care to. Yeah, I really know. should be using glass, and I know that I should. But uh, but a friend of mine who's a researcher, um, his wife got sick years ago, and he started researching everything that they use in their house. <clears throat> and they have no more plastic anything that they eat off of. Smart. Yeah, he's, I, I've worked since 70, 1979. Uh, his original his original research after he became a medical doctor was how the relationship between the cardiopulmonary system relates to the central nervous system. Did that for 15 years. Wow. He is not your average person. Yeah. I gave up using aluminum cookware, aluminum, you know, forks and utensils. I gave up alu- anything in an aluminum container uh probably 30 years ago and it probably saved my life because uh aluminum is not good and it, you know the number one thing they found in alzheimer's patients brains was aluminum and so that that started my life of changing things i started eating more fresh vegetables and uh we have glass we always go down to um, goodwill and we go in and we look for glass sets you know, just glass sets that we can find. But the number one thing we look for is glass cookware and real iron skillets. You know, there's real iron pans. And that's all I cook in nowadays. I got rid of all, all the aluminum and plastic and everything uh, in my life because, you know, they do cause health problems. I did the same thing with aluminum about 30 years ago. I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, and I got to tell you, you know, it's, it's, it, it it's funny. It's in the in the pharmaceutical industry. The other besides car companies, I did a lot of pharmaceutical new product launches, and it's amazing to me how they view health. It really is. <laughs> so I got to see both sides of of playing around. My father was a chiropractor, so I grew up in the medical industry, understanding both sides of the this you know self care uh, preventative medicine as well as what do you do if you get hit by a car? So um, I'm in both camps and I got to tell you, I can see um, how they don't care what causes the disease. All they care about is creating a drug that can stop the disease. So they haven't banned aluminum cookware. I dumped my Calphalon pans, which were very popular back in the nineties and very expensive, but all the cooks and chefs told you to get one. Well, they're made from spun aluminum. I felt bad about dumping them, but my health was more important. And uh, glad you did the same, my friend. <laughs> well, it, it you know, it, it doesn't take a genius. It just takes a little bit of thinking and listening and doing some studying on your own. That's all it takes. It's true. But since we've had the computer and the cell phone that we know of today, that inquisitiveness is gone. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um go anywhere in in public and i defy you to go into a restaurant a bar um any place of entertainment even where there's children that you won't see people on their cell phones yeah it's become an epidemic it is yeah it's crazy I wanted to thank you for being on today's show. We're going to go into the lightning round real quick if you have a few minutes. Uh, but how do we get a hold of you, Richard? Uh, 
Thank you. We'll leave that in the show notes. And we can do a Google search. Do you have a website uh, or anything for the... uh... www.micronucleartech.com. M-I-C-R-O-N-U-C-L-E-A-R-T-E-C-H.com. I love that. And on there, you will see a nine-minute movie. Video. And that video, first of all, all of us that are associated with the micronuclear enterprise and the molten salt nuclear battery, we're all old and experienced. I like that. The majority that. of us came out of the Navy nuclear power program, including the designer, Paul Murata. So what we did was we put together that video. We had help from a great guy down in Los Angeles, I found. And we put together that video to expose people to energy nuclear power and weave in the molten salt nuclear battery that is the first of many that we plan on producing because the nuclear industry starting with the american nuclear society has not done a good job along with all of the nuclear uh companies that have nuclear power plants of educating people over the years we're all aware of that and that's the first video and we will be putting out more it will be on our website I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now I'm going to ask you a a series of questions so we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, You ready? No. (laughs) My first question is, um, what do you do to have fun or to relax? I work on uh, trying to educate the world about uh, how we can eliminate hunger and eliminate thirst. Uh, so that we have people that ha- can have security in their lives and not have their lives be uh, managed by outside influences that want to take advantage of them. Wow. That's a noble cause, my friend. That's a noble cause. Uh, my second question is, uh, is there something about you that we don't know that we should know about you? <laughs> Where do I start or where does my wife start? Um, I'm just a simple guy. I only understand simple things. I had a good upbringing from my parents. My father was a naval aviator. Uh, My mom got me into reading before I can even remember when I was reading. My earliest recollections are at age six years old in 1950. My father got me into math. Um, You know my background. Yeah, I've worked in over 30 countries. I've represented the U.S. at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, I'm in somewhat of a demand, have been several times in my life to go around and talk to various people about various things. But what's carried me all these years is simple reading and math. Yeah. Not complex. Forget about the engineering side and all that. Reading and math. And being in, I, I was born to be, I think I was born to be just naturally inquisitive. Yeah. I like that. I think we've lost touch with logic and shame in our society. We, those two things aren't taught and people aren't shamed enough uh, in public about some of the things that they do. And we also have a generation that hasn't been taught any rules whatsoever. You can do whatever you want. So very interesting. Your parents were good parents. Uh, I guess my last question is, what do you really want your legacy here on planet Earth to be when you uh, decide to leave? Um, well, I'm not going to decide to leave because God's <laughs> already picked me. I in twenty by 2015, I was already asking God, "Why are you keeping me around?" Because I was going to far more funerals than I was going to uh, weddings. Yeah. So it took me until I got involved with the molten salt nuclear battery to realize why I was being kept around and use my life's experience to help this uh, feed the world and uh, get the world clean water and and security. Um, I don't think, I don't give one iota of thought about my legacy. Um, There's people that do, and I've watched them over the years. They spend a lot of time on what's going to be their legacy. I guess if I, if I had to say what's my legacy was, I would say that he just tried to uh, help people have a better life. I love that. And with this new uh, molten salt nuclear battery, I think you you are really going to change lives. 
Richard. I really do. It will. Thank you, my friend, for being on Awakened Nation. Thank you so much, Richard. My pleasure. Take care of yourself. Hey, everybody. Tune in next week. And uh, as you know, we're going to have another awesome guest here on Awakened Nation. Thank you once again, Richard. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.